Great. Awesome. All right. All right. Everybody's ready for the end? No, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It covers more of my bald head. I had a, I had, I have several surprises for you today, okay? But one of the surprises I had was I sat down this morning, and I know the limericks are popular, so I thought, I'll make three limericks for today. And so I, well, no, don't get too excited. I picked out three nice limericks, and then I went here to upload, to get them, and I realized I had not uploaded them. So I have no limericks today, which is really a bummer. Uh, but, but, but I will make the limericks available to you on the link, so you can still see them. You just won't get to see them in here, okay? Um, it's the delivery. I, I, I like this. She, she gets an A. It's all about, it's all about, the, <laughs> it's all about, about the delivery. Okay, so uh, let's get some of the business uh, parts of things done. So first business is we have an exam in here on Thursday night at 6 p.m. That's number one. Um, and I haven't yet got a room for a review session, but I will do a review session on Monday at 5 p.m. And I will videotape it, and I will announce the location of it on the schedule page. I'll put it on the schedule page, okay? So, uh, and I apologize, I just haven't had a chance to get a room for it yet, but it will be Monday evening at 5 p.m., and I will videotape that session. Okay. Uh, next piece of business, I announced it last time. Many of you have asked about it. Uh, as I said, you, uh, on the final exam, you may use a 5 by 8 note card that you get from me. You must get from me. And you have to bring a note card from me to the final exam. Okay? So if you haven't gotten one already, come see me this afternoon. You can come see me Monday. I have some people come see me 20 minutes before the exam. And I'm, I can give it to you, but I will not bring the note cards to the exam. Okay? So come see me sometime before the exam. I'll give you a note card, and you need to get that note card from me, and you need to bring that. And if you have any questions about that, look at the last lecture's video, and it'll explain what the rules are about that. Okay? Okay. Questions about that? Everybody's really ready for all the surprises. Okay, um, let's see. Before I actually say much more, I, I will say how much I have enjoyed this term with you guys. Uh, it has been a lot of fun for me. Um, I very much enjoy teaching this class, and I unfortunately will not be teaching the class next term, which will be the first time in about a dozen years. I haven't taught the two together. And you can see that I like metabolism, and you can see, uh, I think, how metabolism affects your body. And so I, 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 I you'll start to see those things come alive in uh, the next term of the class. So I, I, I feel bad I'm not going to be here for that, but unfortunately I, I, I have other responsibilities I need to do. So, uh, but thank you all for everything uh, this term, and I've really, uh, as I said, enjoyed working with you. I've gotten to know many of you, uh, and that's been a very, very uh, exciting and fun thing for me. So thank you all uh, for, for that. You have been a very, very good class, and you have been a very responsible class. And when you get a class of this size, there's 400 students that signed up for this class. When you get 400 students, uh, you're going to have problems. And I have to say, for a class of this size, I've had very, very few problems. And so I'm very, very happy with that. So, so thank you all. Uh, the last thing is uh, some of you turned in some exams for regrading. I apologize. I don't have those regraded yet, but I will have those uh, regraded uh, if I get some time this afternoon. Otherwise, you can pick them up from me on Monday. And you can get those from me again. The office is not handling exams at this time, okay? So if you need to pick up uh, a regraded exam, come see me on this, no later than Monday, and I'll certainly have it available for you, okay? Now, the other questions relate to the final exam. How um, uh, much ma new material, how much old material, how should I study, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Well, the last question is the hardest one to answer, how should I study? And as I tell many people who come to see me, I really don't know. Okay, because people study in different ways, together, alone, note cards, videos, books, roommates, you know, a variety of ways that they study. So I, I don't have very good advice on that because really no two people study alike. But I will give you some thoughts and strategies relative to the, the final exam. So the final exam, first of all, uh, will be about 150 points. It'll be the same format as you've seen before. Okay. So 150 points means it's going to be about one and a half times as long, but you'll have almost twice as much time to, um, 
Actually, you'll have a little bit more than twice as much time to take it. You'll have 110 minutes. The other exams, you've had 50 minutes. So you'll have 110 minutes to take the exam. So time is almost never an issue on the final. Okay. Um, the new material, that is the material since the last exam, will be proportional to the coverage that we've had in the class. So that means roughly 25 to 30 percent of the exam will be new material. The remainder of the exam will be split roughly proportionally to the material that you, the, the topics we've already covered. So about 70 to 75 percent will be old material. No, I will not copy um, questions from the old exams. And I said, are you going to just use the questions from the old exams? No. I might use one or two. I sometimes use one or two. But they will be different questions, but in the same topic areas. So if you um, are um, using the exams that you've had here as, again, an outline for your studying of the old material, I think that's a reasonable thing for you to do. OK? OK. Um, and um, I think that's the last of my announcements. Any questions or comments about that? Yes? The exam to curve is posted. Oh, yeah. I posted it just the other day. It's on the schedule page. Um, and that curve is right there. OK? So you can see where you are relevant to overall performance. I didn't mention it, but the, the, the uh, distrib grade distribution on the last exam was between a low of 8 and a high of 105. There were about five or six people who made over 100 thanks to the extra credit questions that they had. Okay, so um, yeah, so very very impressed uh, uh, to see that. Um, and let's see, what else do I want to say there? I guess that's it. So, and that's on the schedule page. So you can look at that up on look that up on the schedule page. Oh, I know the last thing I want to remind everybody is that don't forget. Yeah, question. So you will see uh, questions on the final exam and topics that are similar to what you've already seen. That's correct. Yeah. OK? Yes, uh, where? Back there, OK. You got to just, yeah. OK, what, what is it? Um, so you are welcome to pick up the final exams. I'll make the final exams available uh, in the biochem office again if you want to come pick up your exam and look at it. And I'll post a key for that as well. Um, I will try to remember to do that. It's mainly my failing memory that, that will be the limit. So if you want to send me a reminder and say, hey, failing memory, old professor uh, who can't remember anything, will you please send us an email? I, I, will, do, I will do that, yeah. OK? Yes? Will this web page completely disappear after this term? No, I leave my web pages up forever. <clears throat> the only time I take my web pages down is when uh, central computing says, hey, this thing's getting a little old. Maybe you should take it down. So I've got web pages up there for at least seven or eight years. So, yeah. Yeah. OK. And, um, yeah. We don't have a lot of material to cover, so this is good. But we do have some surprises. Any other questions? OK. Well, let's uh, get through the last of the oh, I did the wrong one here. Let's get through the last of the material. Because uh, there's still some interesting things about uh, glycogen metabolism. There's kind of a surprise uh, that comes up with glycogen metabolism that I like to make you aware of. Um, surprises that you're aware of are better than surprises that all of a sudden you go, oh my god, I didn't know there was going to be on the exam, right? So you don't like those kind of surprises. All right, so last time I talked about uh, the uh, control of uh, phosphoprotein phosphatase. That's the PP1 that we see here. And phosphoprotein phosphatase is, I'll remind you, is the enzyme that takes the phosphate off of the various proteins. So phosphoprotein phosphatase will remove phosphate off of uh, glycogen phosphorylase A to make glycogen phosphorylase B. It will take the phosphate off of glycogen synthase B to make the glycogen synthase A. It will take the phosphate off of phosphorylase kinase to convert it into the less active or inactive form. Okay? There are other w proteins that we talked about that get phosphorylated. And yes, it will take those phosphates off of those as well, some of the things in, in glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, for example. So phosphoprotein phosphatase, that one enzyme, is very good at reversing 
all the phosphorylations that we've talked about so far, and also in reversing the effects of epinephrine. Okay? So phosphoprotein phosphatase is activated. I haven't shown you. In fact, there's a figure in the notes that shows you activation of uh, some um, uh, enzymes relevant to insulin. I would advise that you probably not look at that figure. Okay? Uh, I haven't gone into it this year, and I, the reason I haven't gone into it is I find that students find it's a little confusing because there, is, there are some phosphorylations that happen with insulin stimulation. And by not talking about phosphorylations and focusing only on dephosphorylation, we can understand more clearly what's happening with insulin stimulation of cells. Okay? So insulin stimulation of cells is important because glucose is a poison, and cells take up insulin to reduce that, the effects of that poison. Then cells have to deal with that poison, and that's the things that insulin is affecting inside the cells as well. Okay? So, uh, I'm not going to go through those, but that's um, what's up with those. Now, so phosphoprotein phosphatase is very important. You can see how the epinephrine pathway turns off phosphoprotein phosphatase in this figure, and it turns it off via a phosphorylation. It phosphorylates the inhibitor, and it also phosphorylates this protein called G that holds on to it. In the highlights, I mentioned the fact that this G has two different forms. There's a form in the liver called G sub L, and there's a form here called G sub M, and for our purposes, we will consider them essentially the same. Okay? Now, the surprise that I have for you with glycogen metabolism actually relates to um, a very interesting uh, action right here. Okay? And this came as a surprise to the people who worked with glycogen um, phosphorylase and glycogen synthase. Okay? Let me just tell you the experiment that they did here. They've got some glycogen phosphorylase A, which of course you know means it is in the phosphorylated form. It's the, what we think of as the more active form. Okay? And if I have some glycogen phosphorylase A sitting in a tube along with some glycogen, okay, I can measure the effect of the addition of various things on the action of phosphorylase A. If we think of phosphorylase A as more active, and it is, okay. however, there's something interesting that happens. If I have phosphorylase A, and I have some glycogen there, and I add glucose, and I also have glycogen synthase in the, in, in the reaction as well. So I've got phosphorylase sitting there, I've got synthase sitting there, okay? I've got glycogen sitting there, and I add some glucose, Something interesting and odd happens. Okay? What happens, first of all, isn't totally surprising. What happens, first of all, is that we see glycogen phosphorylase A loses activity. Is that a surprise or not a surprise? Why would glycogen phosphorylase A lose activity if I add glucose? It what? Well, n not quite, although that is in the right direction. Why would glycogen, why would we see a loss of activity of glycogen phosphorylase A if I add glucose? Yes? Okay, you don't want to break down more glycogen. I understand that, but I'm saying what mechanism that we've talked about so far explains that? Goes to the T state. I have a prize for you. A prize for you is that you get a free copy of my Metabolic Melody songbook. <laughs> I have one more. I brought two. Okay. So remember that glucose converts glycogen phosphorylase A from the R state into the T state. And if there's no glucose, it stays in the R state, right? Okay. All right. That sort of makes sense. But then we see glycogen synthase converts from the B form to the A form. And moreover, we're also seeing that glycogen phosphorylase A not only is converting into the T state, it's also going to the B form. How in the world can we explain this? The only enzymes we've put into this reaction are glycogen phosphorylase uh, A and glycogen synthase B along with some glycogen. Well, this turns out to be one of the very cool surprises that turned up in glycogen metabolism. Okay? It turns out 
that glycogen phosphorylase A associates with this protein G. Now, since G associates with the phosphoprotein phosphatase, okay, the reactions that you see happening on the screen occur and explain what you just saw in the last slide. Okay? Normally, glycogen phosphorylase A in the R state, meaning no glucose, is floating around. It is binding to um, glycogen, and it's cle cleaving glycogen to make gl uh, glucose 1-phosphate. Okay? The positioning of the glycogen phosphorylase A is blocking the active site of phosphoprotein phosphatase. Okay? So when we have the configuration that you can see on the left, uh, phosphoprotein phosphatase is blocked and is inactive. Okay? What glycogen phosphorylase is doing is it's carrying around with it the very thing that's going to inactivate it. When we add glucose, what happens to glycogen phosphorylase A? It goes from the R state to the T state. And when it goes from the R state to the T state, it gets let go of by the G. Now what happens? Well, glycogen phosphorylase is no longer blocking the phosphoprotein phosphatase. The phosphoprotein phosphatase is active. And what does it start doing? The one thing it knows how to do best, it, know, it, it starts to clip phosphates off, so it converts phosphorylase A into B, and it converts glycogen synthase B into A. Now, this turns out to be really useful for cells, because what the cells can do at that point is it means it gives them a very quick way to switch from breaking down glycogen to synthesizing glycogen, because this becomes inactive almost instantly, and this becomes active almost instantly. And that high concentration of glucose, which has been contributing to this effect, disappears because it gets made into glycogen. Okay? So this is a really, really cool mechanism that's there, and it explains the last result. This is why when we add glucose to the mixture of the glycogen phosphorylase A and the glycogen synthase B, that we see, first of all, Phosphorylation, uh, dephosphorylation occurs, dephosphorylation occurs, and we see the inactivation of this enzyme. Questions about that? Okay. Yeah? Well, Say it again. Why doesn't it cleave it off here? Because this thing's blocking the active site. So the phosphates aren't accessible to this. All right? So you saw the example in the protein kinase A where the regulatory subunits physically blocked the active sites. This is physically blocking the active site of this enzyme. So the enzyme doesn't have access to the phosphate. Well, this thing's really making a lot of noise. This enzyme doesn't have access to the, to the phosphate that it can clip it off. OK? Other questions? Yes? I'm sorry? OK, so her, she says that glucose, I think it's sort of a question, is glucose coming in to sort of start the synthesis of glycogen? And I don't like to think of it that way. No, not quite, OK? Remember that cells are bringing in glucose, OK? for a variety of reasons. One, they may be muscle cells that need the energy. Okay? Two, they might simply be reducing the blood glucose concentration so that they can deal with that in either making glycogen or going through glycolysis. And that one sort of makes sense with what you had to say. But let's think of the first scenario. In the first scenario, we have a circumstance where the muscle cell is doing exercise. It needs the energy. But when the muscle cell stops doing exercise, the energy need is going to go down. And when the energy need goes down, what happens to glycolysis? It slows down. And so the increasing concentration of glucose is reflecting the fact that we don't want to run any more through glycolysis. Does that make sense? Yes, up there.
Uh huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Say it again. No, no. Glucagon and epinephrine are inactivating PP1. Inactivating, right? Because remember, they're phosphorylating the PI1, which is the inhibitor of the PP1. They're also phosphorylating the G, which is letting, meaning it's letting go of the um, 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 PP1. OK? Does it make sense? A lot of puzzled looks. I give a book for a good question. No good questions? OK. I'll have to find another reason to give a book. All right. So uh, that's what's happening with this. Now, one of the things that we see, not surprisingly, are uh, that there are genetic mutations that have significant impact on glycogen metabolism. And I always like to show this last slide, not to give you a whole bunch of new stuff to memorize, because what I'm going to show you, you're not required to memorize at all okay, on this last slide. All right? But rather to show you how sometimes it's a little hard to understand the effect of mutation. Okay? So here's a patient who has a disease called Pompe's disease. They've got a mutation in their glycogen metabolizing or metabolizing related enzymes that leads to the accumulation of glycogen. And all those little black dots there are glycogens. This patient is not breaking down glycogen well. And that's a common problem with the, uh, many of the uh, diseases associated with glycogen metabolism. This table, again, you're not responsible for anything on this table, but this table in fact, we're pretty much done with all the new stuff in the course. I always like to say you can set your pens down at this point if you'd like and just think a little bit. Okay? This table uh, shows various diseases described by various people over the years and the, their name for the people who discovered them and the enzymes that are defective uh, in those. Okay? Here's uh, Pompe's disease. It relates to an inability of lysosomes, which are breakdown uh, organelles in our cells, to break down. Okay, uh, uh, alpha-1,4 bonds, alpha-1 glucosidase. So since glycogen is full of alpha-1,4 bonds, that's why you saw all those um, um, uh, organelle, that organelle, all those little black dots accumulate in the last uh, slide. Some of these are, have very drastic effects. Okay, Pompe's disease, uh, cardiorespiratory failure causes death usually before age two. Not surprising, you're basically plugging up all the lysosomes and you're there. Okay, all right. The um, uh, other diseases like uh, von Gerke's disease, okay, this, this actually lacks the ability of glucose 6-phosphatase to work. How does that affect glycogen metabolism, do you think? How might that affect glycogen metabolism? It wouldn't allow synthesis of glucose from glucose 6-phosphate, OK? And how does that affect glycogen metabolism? There's a book writing on this, guys. Who has an answer for that? Yes? So it's not converted to glucose 1-phosphate. Not quite. You're close. No, no, it's not the 1,6-bisphosphate. Garrett? When you think of a, when you keep going through cycles, you wouldn't have the same thing going back and forth. That's partly true, but that's not quite the answer. There's actually an enzymatic answer here. But, you're, but you, what you said is correct. Garrett's the closest so far. <laughs> He's ready for the book. <laughs> what does glucose 6-phosphate go to besides glucose? It could go through glycolysis, but I'm not going through glycolysis. It doesn't it go? No, well, it, it actually, it can go there, too. Actually, I think that's where the book. Where, where did you go? Who said that? All right, there's a book. All right. It does go to the, it can go to the pentose phosphate. That wasn't what I was looking for, but actually, it's a very good observation. All right, glucose 6-phosphate goes to glucose 1-phosphate, right? And what is glucose 1-phosphate the product of? 
glycogen breakdown, right? So if you start accumulating product, what's going to happen to the breakdown? Okay, so you're going to have some problems. You're, going to, you're not going to break down glycogen properly because the concentrations of the product are going to start inhibiting your enzyme. All right, the last one I'll mention is right here. It's called McArdle's uh, disease, and this one is kind of surprising. This is a disease that uh, has a mutation that inactivates the phosphorylase in the um, muscle cells. You might think that the inability to break down glycogen in muscle cells might be a pretty drastic thing. And this microphone is really bad today. Why? Okay. We're haunted. Uh, but if you look at this, it has a limited ability to perform strenuous exercise because of painful muscle cramps. Otherwise, patient is normal and well developed. There's something that you know that explains this. There's a cycle that you know that allows this patient to be alive. What is the cycle? The Cori cycle, right? Because the Cori cycle kicks in when blood glucose levels start falling, and these muscle cells get, get, um, tired, uh, get, get painful because they're running out of glucose, but the Cori cycle ba uh, uh, bails them out because the, the um, liver starts releasing glucose and saves the muscle cells. So it's a pretty remarkable thing that you can have a deficiency in the ability to break down glycogen in your muscle cells and still live a, a reasonably normal life pretty well. Questions about that? Comments about that? Well, I do have a surprise for you guys today. And I'm looking to see if my surprise has arrived in the back of the room. I'm hopeful. Hello, surprise in the back of the room. Is it just you? OK, hold on. I, well, maybe we're still early. I'm still, still waiting on, are there others? OK, well, we'll, we'll, wait a, we'll wait a couple more minutes. I'll do a little song and dance up here while we're waiting for our other surprise. They were supposed to be here by now. Maybe that's a surprise for me. Like I say, surprises that you know what they are are good. I, I was expecting, not a surprise, I didn't know what it was. I guess I can do the setup for the surprise. The setup for the surprise was, um, to tell you a brief story, OK? So you guys probably know that I'm a very big Beatles fan. A lot of my songs come from Beatles songs. And I really, truly uh, love the Beatles. I um, uh, am old enough that I remember the Beatles when they first came to America, which was 50 years ago this year. Uh, and that was a very um, cool thing. Uh, it was one of the, um, certainly musical events, that was probably one of the highlights of the, uh, of the 20th century. Um, I've always thought of the Beatles sort of like this. They, uh, <laughs> if only, if only, right? Now this is going to stretch, stretch. They're not there. That's weird. They were supposed to be there at 20 after. <laughs> Paul McCartney was, was supposed to be here. <laughs> He and Ringo were going to do this little thing in the back. Um, well, um, you want a joke? Oh, you want a joke? OK, all right, one last joke. One last joke for the term. Um, let me think here. Joke, joke, joke. Um, OK, I've got a dumb joke. Dumb joke, all right? So there's, this, there's these two hunters, OK? And these two hunters um, go out to this farmer's uh, place, and they say, hey, we want to uh, do some hunting on your property. Is that OK? Because they ask permission. And the, the farmer says, yeah, he says, that's really OK. But you know, my, my farmland is very, very uh, wooded. It's very complicated. And most people that come out here and go hunting get lost. Are you sure you want to do this? 
And they said, yeah, yeah, you know, we're, we're pretty smart. We've got compass. We know what we're going to do. We'll go out there. We'll be fine. And the farmer says, well, that's what everybody says, but they go out and they get lost anyway. Okay? But I tell you what, if you get lost out there, just, just take and shoot three times up in the air, and I'll come out and, and find you and, and get you back to your truck. And these farmers say, oh, that's really nice. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Right? Just, I really appreciate that. So they go out, and they get hunting, and, they, they, and sure enough, after about an hour, they have no idea where they are. And the one, the one hunter looks at the other and says, you know, the farmer was right. You know, I guess we might as well give up and, and you know, get him out of here. So shoot three times in the air. So the guy goes and he shoots three times in the air. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait. He goes, that's a little odd. He said, shoot three times in the air. You know, what's going on? Well, I don't know. Try shooting three times in the air again. So he goes and he shoots three times in the air, and of course they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and nothing happens. Well, now they're starting to get a little bit worried because it's getting close to dark. So we'll shoot three times in the air again. And the guy that's shooting the three, three, three times in the air says, I hope this works. I'm almost out of arrows. I told you it was lame. That's my last joke. <laughs> So still nobody back in the back. All right. Kyle, if you'd like to come join me, I would love to have you. If you don't want to join me, that's fine, too. Oh, there we are. There we are, our, our group. Is that you? Would you like to come down and join us? <laughs> Paul McCartney had a very successful solo career. And he's a lot better looking than I am, too. So come, let, me, let me invite Kyle Cole and Linda Wheeler, uh, Linda Benson, to come down and join me. And I, we had a group, but somehow they've disappeared. So this was our surprise for the day. Um, and you have to wear a hat. That's a rule here. OK. The Beatles were succeeded, of course, by the Bee Gees, way before you guys as well. And the Bee Gees, of course, were succeeded by these lovely boys. <laughs> right? And these guys were succeeded by this. These are all Bs, by the way. You should notice that. The Beatles, the BGs, the Backstreet Boys. And you know what has to happen next. Yeah. OK. I, I show you these because hopefully we're going to sound better than that. So I don't know. And we have a B of our own. And it's a B in our bonnet. It's known as the Biocomical Choir. OK. And the theme of our, our show is, oops, we're going to do it again. OK. We do this every year. And we're set. So we, hopefully, we're, we've got some, some lyrics. And we're going to post the lyrics on the screen. Come on down. Come on down, please. We need you. We need you. <laughs> yes, we do. Danielle, this is Danielle, who is brave to come and join us. Thank you, Danielle. Give her, thank you. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> come on, Sophie. Sophie, come on down. Sophie Pierzolowski. This is great. Everybody gets an introduction. So we have a group. This is good. Oops, we're doing it again. All right. Is everybody ready? No. You've never seen this before in your life. Well, you may regret this. You never know. These guys may regret it. I don't know. All right. So we have several songs for you today. We have four songs and a video at the very end uh, that we hope you enjoy. OK? The first one's a brand new song. I haven't done it before in class. And so, at least I don't think I've done it before in class. And uh, it's to the tune of an old Beatles song called And I Love Her. And it's, we'll start off, so. If I am missing meals on busy days, that's when my body steals glucose away. You can join us from my liver. It starts with glucagon when I'm weak need The hormone acts to spawn new energy in my liver. The signaling acts rapidly. CAMPs fire up kinase. Phosphorylase then gets 
reactivated. So glycogen begets glucose phosphated in my liver. <laughs> then in the last step here, a phosphatase makes phosphate disappear with no delays in my liver. All right. Okay. <laughs> we didn't hear you guys there. We're going to hear you, hopefully, on the next one. They're getting rowdy. The natives are getting rowdy here. Okay, so the next song is... Um, something that we're actually teaching you for next term already. It's the very first thing you'll do next term. It's called the citric acid cycle. And it's to the tune of an old Irish song called When Irish Eyes Are Smiling. Okay? The citric acid cycle is a source of energy. It gets electrons moving while reducing NAD. It starts with citric acid turning to a conitate, which becomes an isocitrate on the way to glutarate. The loss of one more carbon gives sucks anil-CoA and then succinic acid when the CoA goes away. A further oxidation gives one transfumarate, which gains a water on the next step to make malate. One simple oxidation makes OAA, you see, which combined with ACOA returns a cyclically. Oh boy, I can't do the high notes or any of the notes. Okay. Now, I know a lot of you are signed up to take my eCampus course for next term, and so the next song is dedicated to all of you who are taking that course or who have ever taken an eCampus course. This is to the tune of an old TV theme show that's even older than I am, okay? Uh, back in the 50s, a talking horse called Mr. Ed. Okay? And the title of the song is Distance Ed. A course is a source, of course, of course, of all of the knowledge that we endorse. A major force for better or worse is the campus distance ed. It's true to outsource a college course. There are a few standards to be enforced. The long and shorts we reinforce the campus distance ed. A classroom class meets every week the same time every day. But distance ed is most unique. It's flexible schedules, OK. E-course is a source, of course, of course, of online assistance for lab reports. You're not enrolled in an online course? Then sign up for it. You'll love distance ed. <laughs> OK. We have one more that we're going to sing, and then we'll have a video that we'll watch at the very end. And the one that we're going to sing is sort of a going away for everybody. It's to a tune of a Christmas melody. And this is one that I think everybody will know, and I would love to hear the entire room in unison on this, OK? It's to the tune of Winter Wonderland. We've sung another one to, the, to that same tune earlier in the term. And this is called BB Wonderland. OK. Milam Hall is 1230. And a hern's getting wordy. He walks to and fro while not talking slow, giving it to me before 5 0. I was happy when the term got started. Lecture notes and videos galore. MP3s got added to my iPod. But recitations sometimes were a bore, and exams bit me roughly. When the curve turned out ugly, I don't think it's so. My scores are too low. Sliding by in BB450. Finally, there's an examination on next Thursday night at 6 p.m. I'll have my car packed with information. 
so I don't have to memorize it then. And I'll feel like a smarty with my jam pack no cardy. Just one more to go, and then ho, ho, ho. I'll be done with BB450. Okay, so before I, I play the last uh, tune, which we're not going to sing, but we can all, the, the, the lyrics will be on the screen, as you can see. I want to thank the uh, Biocomical Choir, Danielle, Kyle, Linda, and Sophie. Thank you guys very much. Thank all of you for being great singers and for being a great uh, student uh, body as well. So the last one is uh, not a topic that we've covered in the class, but it's one of my favorite things. It's actually a YouTube video that I made for a song that you'll hear about in a topic next, next term. It's to the tune also of an old Beatles tune called Across the Universe, and it's called uh, Across the Nucleus. Oh, hold on, I've got to stop that. Get the, get the audio on. You, you're welcome to sing, please. And in fact, the, the lyrics will appear on the screen. Okay, so here we go. Make it spool like balls that wander in the chromosome, unwinding that is duplicated there across the nucleus. Find me such an RNA to leave the path for DNA. Thank you guys, you've been a wonderful class.